I've been dead for about 14 years now. Yeah, you heard me, dead. Well, at least according to my family. They declared me dead about 14 years ago when I first took steps to escape the abusive marriage they had arranged for me when I was a teenager within the fundamentalist religious community where I was born. I want to tell you about my life and death as a troublemaker and how that led me to my mission to end forced and child marriage in the United States. I was raised in Brooklyn, but I was raised in the ultra-Orthodox Jewish community. Anybody here familiar with that community? A few of you are. So those of you who are familiar with the community understand that I was raised completely cut off from the outside world. We had no television, no radio, no newspapers. I had no real contact with anybody who wasn't also ultra-Orthodox Jewish. I had to wear long, shapeless skirts and cover nearly every inch of my skin. I did not have this outfit back then. And I went to an all-girls school where I learned how to cook, and I learned how to sew, and I learned a lot about God. And that's pretty much all. I actually um, had to sign a paper when I was in high school promising that I would not take driver's education or the SATs. Both of those were forbidden for a girl from that community because really what I was taught is my goal was to become a wife and a mother. Now, my whole life I was kept completely separate from boys and from men. I was never allowed to have a boyfriend or even talk to a boy. But the understanding was always that I would get married young, either in high school or right out of high school, that the marriage would be arranged for me through a matchmaker. So there was never a question about whether I would marry. That was not a choice, that was a given. And there was never a question about when I would marry. That was going to be as soon as the matchmaker found a match for me. I was told that I had the choice of whom to marry. But looking back, I can tell you choice is kind of a strong word to use for this because um, it was basically limited to the guys that the matchmaker brought to my family. I was never allowed to go out and meet somebody on my own. Um, so shortly after high school, when the matchmaker brought the match to me and uh, introduced him to me and to my family, I, you know, I did get to, uh, to meet him. I did get to go on a limited number of so-called dates. But these dates, first of all, we were never allowed to be alone together or to have any physical contact on these dates. So they're not the, your typical dates that you would think of. Also, the average number of these so-called dates in that community is seven. So I had a matter of hours over a period of a few weeks to decide something as important as, do I want to spend the rest of my life with this stranger? And remember, I was really young and really inexperienced, never having dated or even talked to a boy before. And I was also under intense pressure not to say no to a match. I knew what would happen if I said no to more than a couple of matches. The matchmakers would write me off as the picky one. And no matchmaker wants to deal with the picky one. And like everybody else in that community, I was terrified of turning 20 and still being single. Because in that community, that's basically a death sentence. You're 20, you're still single, everyone assumes something is wrong with you. The matchmakers don't want anything to do with you. You're probably going to be stuck forever single in a community where being single is considered very shameful. And so faced with all this pressure, I said yes to my match at 19, very happily. We had a six-week engagement. During that time, still never allowed to be alone together, still never allowed to have any physical contact. And then about three months after the matchmaker first brought this stranger to me, I became his wife. My husband and I turned out to have nothing at all in common. It was not a good match. I mean, even having a conversation was a challenge for us because we just thought so differently about everything. But worse than that, he turned out to be violent. And I discovered this only one week after our wedding. He woke up late that morning, and he was furious at himself, not at me. He was just furious at himself for being late. And so he started screaming and cursing in a way that I had never heard before. And he was jumping up and down. And I was terrified. He's a big guy. He's six feet tall, 240 pounds. I've always been small. I was a teenage girl. This was a stranger to me. I just didn't know what to do. So I was just kind of cowering in the corner. And then in this blind rage, he punched his fist through the wall hard enough that he left a big hole in the sheetrock. And then he ran out 
And I just stood there shaking, looking at that hole in the wall and thinking, oh my God, he just did that because he woke up late. I mean, what kind of life am I going to have with this man? And if he can do that to the wall, what is he going to do to me? A few days later was the first time he threatened to kill me, which is something that became kind of regular within our marriage. So it was very clear to me early on that this was not a good marriage. But what also became very clear to me early on was that there was just no way out for me. I I did ask for help. I went all the places that an Orthodox Jewish girl is supposed to go for help. I went to my family. I went to his family. I went to the rabbis. I explained what was happening. And it seemed that everybody around me had no understanding of domestic violence because the answer I got from everyone was, oh, come on, you know, he's just young. He was only three years older than I was. So it was, he's just young. He has to grow up. You'll see. If you're good to him, he'll be good to you. I also, under Orthodox Jewish law, I did not have reproductive rights. I was not allowed to use birth control, and I was required to have sex with my husband. It didn't matter what he said or did to me. I had to have sex with him. And so 11 months after my wedding, my first daughter was born, and pretty soon I had two daughters. I also, under Orthodox Jewish law, did not have financial rights. I was not allowed to have a job. I was not allowed to have any of my own money, a bank account, a credit card. Under Orthodox Jewish law, in fact, if my husband allowed me to get a job, any money I earned would go to him. I also, under Orthodox Jewish law, had limited legal rights. A man is allowed to divorce his wife under Orthodox Jewish law, but a woman does not have that right. I did not have the legal right to end my own marriage. And so I was just trapped. The only way out for me would have been if my family had agreed to take me back in. But let me tell you about betrayal. My family wouldn't take me back in. I probably would have remained trapped forever in this abusive marriage if at age 27 I hadn't done something that was considered really rebellious in that community. I started seeing a therapist who was not from within that community. And that was a big sin and a no-no. I had to pay cash, and it was so difficult to arrange going and coming back without getting caught that I went only twice. But that was enough to change my life because this therapist, for the first time, explained to me what domestic violence was. And she was the first person in my life who confirmed for me that I was right to be concerned for my safety and my daughter's safety. And she also told me something I didn't know. She told me that I had legal rights, that the police would protect me from my husband even though I was married to him. I had no idea of that. And at the time, we had moved to New Jersey, to Lakewood, New Jersey, where there's a very large Orthodox Jewish community. And after a particularly violent incident at home, based on what this therapist had told me, I became, I believe, I don't know this for sure, but I believe I was the first woman in the Orthodox Jewish community to walk into the police department in Lakewood, New Jersey, and ask for a temporary restraining order against my then husband. Thank you. Well, don't, don't applaud yet. You'll see how it ended. Not so great. But anyway, so the police were clearly not accustomed to dealing with somebody from that community. There were plenty of uncomfortable comments, but they did give me the temporary restraining order. They served it on my then husband. They removed him from the home, and that should have been a good first step towards safety and freedom. It should have been something to applaud. But here's where I messed up. I forgot to take into account the fact that I had always been taught one of the gravest sins I could commit was turning over my fellow Jew to the secular authorities. That's a sin that's punishable by death. And by going to the police and getting a restraining order, I had committed that sin. So I started getting phone calls from everyone, my new, my family, my friends, my neighbors, the rabbis. Not a single person asked me, are you okay? What happened? Why did you get a restraining order? Do you need help? Everyone just had the same question for me. Have you completely lost your mind? Who, who does this? In the Orthodox Jewish community in Lakewood and in a lot of other Orthodox Jewish communities, they have their own security force, their own ambulance squad. You call 911 only if your house is on fire. It's just not done. And the rabbis in Lakewood sent an attorney to my house, an Orthodox Jewish male attorney, came to my house, he drove with me to family court, and he had me stand in front of the judge and tell the judge that I wanted to drop the restraining order. And I will never forget that moment standing there when the judge asked me, are you doing this of your own free will? 
which I assume is a question a judge asks anybody who's dropping a restraining order. But it was a surreal moment for me where I was thinking, no, I am terrified. This is not even my attorney standing next to me. I don't know where I'm going to go. My life is in danger. But I couldn't think of any safe way to communicate that to the judge. And so I lied. And I said, yes, Your Honor. And that was a real turning point for me. Because when I got home that day, I realized two very important things. I realized, one, if I stay, my husband is going to kill me. He made that very clear. He would describe to me in detail how he was going to kill me. And I realized, too, that nobody was going to help me to leave. My family and my community were not going to help me. Even the police couldn't help me. And I finally, that day at age 27, put a plan in place to get out on my own. And it was not an easy escape plan. It ended up being a five-year escape plan. The first thing that I did was I started to save up cash because I realized you can't do anything without cash. But that was not an easy thing to do because my husband did not allow me to have anything that was private. He would look through the pockets of my skirts hanging in the closet, and he would do this in front of me so that I would know that I belong to him and everything I own belongs to him. But there was one place in the house that I knew he would never look. And if any of you want to hide something at home, you can feel free to borrow this trick. It was a box of whole grain total in the pantry closet. <laughs> Anyone here like total? Uh, only two people here like total, so don't hide anything in their box of cereal. But for most people, you can put something in their total box and they'll never find it. And the other thing that I did was I realized I needed an education. And so I went online to search for college. By the way, this is before the rabbis in Lakewood, New Jersey banned the internet. That's something you can do, apparently. You can ban the internet. So I went online, and I did a search for a college in New Jersey. And I found a school called Rutgers University. Maybe some of you have heard of it. And I thought, well, this sounds like a good enough school. And so without telling anybody, I submitted my application. It was a very bizarre application. This is embarrassing, but in high school, where cooking and sewing were core subjects, I had failed both cooking and sewing. <laughs> and I had never taken the SATs, and half of my high school transcript was written in Hebrew. It was, as I said, a very bizarre application, but for some reason, and maybe for that reason, Rutgers accepted me. And I had to announce to my family that I was doing something no man or woman in my family had ever done. I was going to college. It was not happy news. My mother was literally speechless when I told her. She just didn't answer me. And my husband said, you're not going. And I said, hmm, actually, I am going. And there is nothing you can do to stop me. And I'll always remember my oldest sister's exact words to me. I remember where I was standing in the kitchen when she said this to me. She said, Freddy, you're going to regret this. A woman belongs at home. Now, college was not easy. I had no academic background, and I had two little kids and a one-hour commute to school. I had to put my kids on the school bus and race up to take classes and race back to get them. I had a husband who almost every day tried to get me to drop out. But college was also exhilarating. I was learning things for the first time in my life, making friends for the first time with people from other communities. And college changed me so much as a person that during my last year at Rutgers, I took my next rebellious step, my next step toward freedom. I stopped wearing the head covering that's required for Orthodox Jewish women from their wedding night through the rest of their lives. I always felt so demeaned wearing the wig. And so I said, I'm not doing this anymore. And that was just too much for my family. My family had kind of grudgingly accepted that I was a college student because, you know, the neighbors don't have to know that I'm in college. They thought it was just you know, something silly I was going through, eventually I would drop out. But the fact that I was walking around without a head covering in that community was such a slap in their face that that was the day they completely and immediately shunned me. Now, shunning is a form of honor violence that I think a lot of people don't realize happens here in the United States. And I wish I could explain how traumatic it is when everybody that you know and love suddenly cuts off all contact with you. Now, I come from a large family. Both of my parents were alive at the time, and I have three sisters and two brothers. And each one is married and has, on average, 10 children, which is very common in that community. And I have hundreds of cousins and uncles and aunts, and all of them and all of my friends completely cut off contact with me that day. 
I have one sister who kept in touch with me briefly at first, and she's the one who told me that the rest of my family was planning to sit Shiva for me or go through the Jewish mourning ritual for me as if I had literally died. Well, it's ironic because it was at that, really that moment that my family declared me dead that I started to feel alive. Thank you. I graduated from Rutgers at 32 as valedictorian of my class of 10,000. Thank you. Thank you. I wish you had been there when I gave my valedictory address. That was awesome. The only, only family members who were there were my two daughters. I um, got a degree in journalism, and I got a job during my last semester as a reporter at the Asbury Park Press, one of the largest papers in New Jersey. I skipped the religious courts that would have discriminated against me as a woman, and I went straight to civil court, where I got divorced, I got full custody of my two daughters, and I got a final restraining order against my ex-husband. I bought my first pair of jeans, my first of many, many skirts. I have never since then worn a dress or a skirt of a reasonable length. It's always a little too short. I became a devout atheist. That's, thank you. And with the help of the police, I moved out of the Orthodox Jewish community in Lakewood, and I moved up to northern New Jersey, where eight years ago now, I became financially and emotionally independent enough to buy a small house for myself and my two daughters. And it was at the closing for the house that I realized, you know, I made it, but I know how lonely and traumatic my journey was. And I know that there are other women, girls, and others in the United States who are trying to say no to a forced marriage. Either before it happens, they're trying to tell their parents, no, I don't want this. Or they're already in it and they're trying to get out of it and they just need a little bit of help. And that includes the friends and the sisters that I left behind. And most of them don't have a whole grain total box full of cash. I had more than $40,000 in my box of cereal by the time I was ready to leave. And most of them are facing religious laws and social customs like I once was that make divorce very difficult, especially for women. And a lot of them, like me, have a family that not only will support them, but will actually work against them. And that's when I founded Unchained at Last, which at the time, and it still remains, the only organization dedicated to helping women, girls, and others in the United States to escape from forced marriages. We provide really comprehensive wraparound services, crucial, often life-saving services, everything from coordinating escapes, even international escapes when families take their a child overseas to force a child, an adult or minor child into marriage overseas and we work with the US State Department to bring them back or escapes right here in the US, free legal representation for divorce, child custody, any other kind of legal battles, all kinds of emotional and social services, always for free. And we're a tiny team, a budget of under half a million dollars, and since 2011, we have helped hundreds, more than 500 uh, women, girls, LGBTQ youth whose families use marriage as a form of conversion therapy, and many others across the United States to escape forced marriages. But then, as those of you who were at the rally heard, more and more girls under the age of 18, started reaching out to Unchained to beg for the same help that we were providing to adults. And we discovered that there's almost nothing we can do when it's a child who's facing a forced marriage. And we discovered what a problem child marriage here is here in the United States. Does anybody know the youngest age that you can marry here in the United States? I'm hearing 8, 12, 14. As horrible as those numbers are, they're still too high. The youngest age you can marry in, the United, in many states in the United States is zero. Like Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Yemen, there are many U.S. states that don't specify any minimum age for marriage. So what we discovered uh, at about 2015, that this first came to our attention at Unchained at Last, marriage at the time was, child marriage or marriage before the age of 18 was legal in all 50 U.S. states. At the time, there were 27 states that did not specify any minimum age for marriage. And we did groundbreaking research. We pulled marriage license data from across the U.S. and discovered that between 2000 and 2010, an estimated 248,000 children, as young as 12, 
were married in the United States. Almost all of them were girls married to adult men. There are two main problems with child marriage. I mean, there are so many problems with child marriage, but I'm gonna give you the two main ones. The first one is the reason that I'm so passionate about ending child marriage, which is that it can so easily be a forced marriage. Before a child turns 18, a child does not have the rights of adulthood in any US state. And that means taking basic steps to either prevent an impending forced marriage or to get out of one that's already happened becomes uh, very difficult, if not impossible. Something as basic as leaving home to escape from parents who are trying to force you to marry or to escape from an abusive husband. You can't do that in most states before you're 18. In many states, if you run away before 18, you're considered a runaway. The police can take you back home against your will. In some states, you could even be charged with a status offense for leaving home before 18. We as advocates at Unchained at Last, if we help somebody who's not yet 18 to leave home, in a lot of states, we could be charged criminally for doing that. That actually happened in one of the cases that we worked on. One of our volunteers was charged criminally for helping a 14-year-old girl escape an impending forced marriage. If we manage to get these girls to a domestic violence shelter, that doesn't help. Domestic violence shelters won't take them in. Even a day before their 18th birthday, there are all kinds of liability issues and funding guidelines that prevent shelters from taking in uh, somebody who's not yet 18. We literally had a shelter once turn away a girl whose birthday was the next day. She was turning 18 the next day. They said, bring her back tomorrow. Contracts with children are voidable typically or void across the United States. That means children can't easily retain an attorney because the retainer agreement is a worthless piece of paper. Which attorney would agree to take on a child as a client? And then perhaps most shockingly, children are not allowed to bring a legal action in their own name typically across the United States, which means in many US states, children can be entered into marriages. They're disempowered throughout that process. It's typically a parent or a judge who enters a child into a marriage and then they don't even have the legal right to file for divorce in most states. That makes no sense. So that's the first really important reason that child marriage is so problematic. And the second really important reason to end marriage before 18 is many studies have looked at what happens to a girl or a woman in the United States who was married before the age of 18. And let me explain to you what happens. A girl in the US or a woman who was married as a teenager uh, first of all, it's 50% more likely to drop out of high school, four times less likely to finish college. She is three times more likely to have at least five children. She is 31% more likely to end up living in poverty as an adult. And then because of the forfeited education, the poverty, the increased stress that come with child marriage, she also faces a 23% increased risk of heart attack, cancer, diabetes, and stroke, and an increased risk of almost every psychiatric disorder. Those are all studies done in the United States. So this is not in a developing country. That's in the US. And then there was a global study that showed that around the world, women who marry before 18 are three times more likely to be beaten by their spouse than women who married at 21 or older. Now, there is a simple solution. Most states already said 18 as the marriage age, but there were these dangerous loopholes. And at the time, in 2015, when we first started doing this, the dangerous loopholes existed in every state that allowed marriage before the age of 18. So we wrote this really simple, common sense legislation that every state can introduce, that it just eliminates those dangerous loopholes. And then I wrote op-eds in Washington Post and the New York Times. I wrote a, an op-ed recently uh, in Refinery29 with, uh, with Chelsea Clinton. Uh, I've written you know, op-eds any paper that will have us. We, um, we organized this, we invented a form of protest called the chain in, where we wear bridal gowns and chains to show legislators what life looks like for a girl or woman who's forced to marry. I gave zillions of media interviews, recruited allies like American atheists to help push legislators across the United States to introduce simple, common sense legislation that ends uh, what the US State Department calls a human rights abuse. The US State Department calls marriage before 18 a human rights abuse. It ends this human rights abuse that destroys girls' lives, costs nothing, harms no one. We were able to introduce legislation in states across the US, almost half the country. And in state after state, legislators said, no, pass on this simple common sense legislation. And I think all of you can guess the reason why. Because God. So the first thing that we heard was, uh, I don't know, pregnant, you know, a teenage girl gets pregnant. Let's say her religion requires her to get married. There was actually a legislator in New Jersey who said out loud 
that Deuteronomy, according to Deuteronomy, a girl who is raped has to marry her rapist. And so we can't pass legislation to end child marriage because then what are we going to do with a girl who gets raped if we can't force her to marry her rapist? There was a legislator in another state who looked me in the eye and she was a Catholic legislator and she said, you know, those Muslims, they're terrible. They force their daughters to marry. It's heartbreaking. You know, we Catholics force our daughters to marry when they get pregnant, but we do it for the right reasons. We do it out of love. So I want everyone to take a second now to just imagine the horror of people openly saying that we should force sexual assault survivors to marry their attackers. I mean, in year 2019, people are saying this out loud. But beyond that, what legislators are ignoring is the fact that study after study has shown that a pregnant teenage girl in the United States who marries is more likely to suffer economic deprivation and instability than a pregnant teenage girl who stays single. There's nothing good about marrying off a pregnant teenage girl, especially if she was raped. But the religious reasoning continued. I've had multiple legislators in different states say to me, you know, Joseph married Mary when she was eight. It was good enough for God. Why isn't it good enough for us? Um, by the way, just take, uh, take a second to think about that. So we want our marriage age to be eight because Joseph married Mary when she was eight. By the way, every Christian person I ask, how old was Mary when she married Joseph? I get a different number from everyone. But these legislators are convinced that it was eight and that therefore it is good enough for all of us, which is, uh, which is absolutely horrific. In New Jersey, the, the bill to end child marriage actually passed in 2017 out of both houses of the legislature with overwhelming bipartisan support. Out of 120 legislators, only five voted no. And they were all white Republican men, by the way, just saying. I'm sure, <laughs> sure that doesn't mean anything. And then the bill got to Governor Christie's desk and Governor Christie, America's most hated governor, conditionally vetoed the bill. It would have been the first bill to end child marriage in the United States and his reasoning was, you know, this is going to interfere with religious customs in the state. So by the way, can we all just take a minute to boo Governor Christie, then Governor Christie. Thank you. So we got to the point at Unchained at last that we started thinking this is never going to happen. No state is ever going to end child marriage. And in a moment of frustration, we all promised that when the first U.S. state took the drastic step of ending child marriage, we would all get tattoos to commemorate the victory. Well, I am very proud to show you my tattoo. Delaware. In May of 2018, Delaware became the first U.S. state to end all marriage before 18 without any exceptions. And then in June of 2018, now that Governor Christie is gone, New Jersey became the second U.S. state to end child marriage. And don't worry, we're not getting a tattoo for every state. For every state. It's one and done on the tattoos. So we now have legislation pending in 11 states. They are not all going to pass, but I'm very hopeful about the bills in Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Nevada, which has the first female majority state legislature in U.S. history. Thank you. That's good for you, Nevada. And this is now, I think, finally becoming a national movement, and this is going to happen. Um, we're going to keep pushing. My family thought I was trouble when I was alive. This dead woman refuses to shut up. Thank you. I, I promise that I will keep pushing and fighting and shouting and chaining in until a girl in the U.S. is never again a bride and until every adult is free to choose whether, when, and whom to marry and whether to get divorced. And I can't think of any better allies in this mission than my fellow atheists. Thank you.